Yeah, his his enthusiasm was what came across more than anything else, and his knowledge of it, of the, of, just his knowledge of the whole event and and what he saw. When he went down, and he tells a story of, or someone else told me the story. When he went down, on one of the dives to the uh, to the wreck, um, he he said, right, I, I want to go to the left. It was with a, a French crew, I think they were. There was Russians and, and the French, they were, they were both doing it. And he said, oh, I want to go off to the left. And they said, no, no, we, we should go off to the right. He said, no, no, I, I, I know where we are, we'll go to the left. And, and they went to the left, and that's where, they, the guy thought they were on the other side of the ship, but Jim knew exactly where they were. And if you go to the left, that's when you come to the wheelhouse and they were there and all, whatever he was looking for. And, and afterwards they asked him and he said, there's a little break in the rail and I knew because of that, that's where we were, because of that little break in the rail. I mean, you know, phenomenal. Wow. All the music shops played it, stores played it all the time. And that music just hit you. It was just, it was, it was a lot to do with the music. That, those songs, Celine Dion singing those songs, just really got to you. They were, they were it was a, Another piece of his genius, Jim's genius, that he actually got a fellow Canadian to sing it, you know, to sing those songs. Because that became, it be, that became the attraction in a way. That, that alerted you to the film. You, the film never left, left your consciousness. You, you, could, you were aware of it all the time because you could hear it everywhere. You'd be sitting next to people on the bus and they'd be humming it, you know. The Abyss came out in 89. A few years later, um, I was just sitting around, you know, in between movies. I'd done Terminator 2, looking for kind of what to do next. I was developing a thing called True Lies. And I, I just happened upon a tape of A Night to Remember. And I hadn't seen it since I was a kid, back in the 60s. And so I popped it in. I sat one afternoon, and I just watched A Night to Remember. And the pieces just fell into place. Modern deep sea robotics, submersibles, the wreck of Titanic, this story, you know, kind of beautifully reproduced in color, the way we could do it now, it was a black and white film, very well made in its time, uh, 1961, I believe. And um, I thought, I've got to do this, but what's my hook, you know? And then it, it popped into my head, it's a love story. I immediately started to do a lot of research about Titanic, and one of the best reference points at the time was a beautiful book called The History of the Titanic that was done by uh, Ken Marshall and Don Lynch. Don Lynch was the historian. Ken Marshall is the preeminent artist who has painted, you know, really all the most memorable uh, paintings of Titanic and Titanic sinking, but also Titanic and all her beauty sailing across the ocean and so on. If you open that book up to the middle, there's a double truck Full, the book is quite large, so this is a painting that is about that wide if you open the book. And it's Titanic in the middle stages of its sinking, beautifully lit, lifeboats leaving, rockets going off, illuminating the night sky. It's, it's somber, it's sad, it's beautiful, it's spectacular. I walked into Peter Chernin's office and you know he said, well, what do you got? And I said, I opened that book to that painting, I turned it around, I put it in front of him and I said, Romeo and Juliet on that. And he stared at the painting for a little while. He said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. I have set pieces that I want to see visually. And those kind of exist in a little pile, but not necessarily in any kind of order, and I don't know how to get there. And then I start working forward from character. You know, what's their backstory? What do they care about? How do they meet? What's intriguing about each other? And so on, I write forward. And then I try to weave it through those, through those bits of visual, uh, uh, visual backdrop that I wanted to see, and it all, you know, fell into place uh, fairly well. I really felt that it was um, a mission and a responsibility to get it right, to to do as well as we could almost as if we could somehow look back through a time window or go back in time and see what was really happening. So we spent a lot of time on the 
kind of forensic analysis, you know, to kind of figure out what was happening during the, the, the flooding and the breakup of the ship because it was kind of glossed over in Night to Remember. Night to Remember was very accurate about the people. It turned out to be not very accurate about the actual sinking of the ship. I wanted that, that beautiful lambent light that you get late in the day during magic hour in an English summer, that sort of thing, except I wanted it at sea. Well, how the hell are you going to do that? You know, well, we talked about literally going to the shipyard in Gdansk and having them build Titanic for us. Maybe not the whole thing, maybe not an actual replica of the ship, but build the upper decks. And maybe we talked about putting them onto some kind of a container ship or something like that and sailing around in the Baltic in the, in the, in the late summer. You know, to get that lighting, to get that look, we talked about all different ways to skin the cat. Ultimately, we came up with this crazy idea of building a studio just across the border in, in Mexico, um, in, uh, you know, in Ensenada. And that way we, would, we could have access to all the craftspeople in Mexico, in Mexico City. We could build our sets down there. We could assemble them, uh, assemble them there right, right across the the border, we could bring our, our keys and our actors down from LA. We didn't, it wouldn't require plane flights, we'd just drive. I could drive back and forth to my, to my house in, in Malibu, which I did. It's kind of a crazy idea, but it worked beautifully. The funny thing is, is there's no formula, but there is a commonality between Titanic and Avatar and even now uh, The Way of Water, which is that when people have a powerful emotional experience in a theater, um, they want to they want to share it. It's not so much that they want to go back themselves. I think that's a factor. They want to just see it again, take it all in, reproduce that feeling. But I think it's more like they want to become the gatekeeper of that experience for somebody else that they care about. You know, friends or you know, loved one, parent, child. You know, whatever it is. So you've got these relationships that are intergenerational. They're among friends. They're dates all that sort of thing, but it, it was about the sharing of the experience. I think that's what a lot of the peak, uh, sorry, I think that's what a, a lot of the repeat viewing was really about, you know, wanting to b gift that experience to someone else. My reaction to reading the script uh, was one of tears. I cried, and there aren't many scripts that can make me cry. and. Uh, it was something that I just felt compelled to want to be a part of. I wasn't, at that point, partnered with Jim. I was uh, leaving being a studio executive, and I had several different options to work with different uh, directors at the time. And having read Planet Ice, because that was the code name for Titanic, um, it was something that I felt very passionate about and uh, excited to get the opportunity to do it. I had worked with Jim as a studio executive. I was uh, the studio suit assigned uh, to True Lies. I remember when Jim found that out, he thought True Lies would be more of a hands-off production, that he came into a meeting we were having. Um, and he was a little bit late, and he came in, but he walked right around the table, ignored everybody else after hearing I was going to be involved, and walked up to me while I was sitting down and looked down at me and said, so I understand we're going to get to be pretty good friends or bitter enemies. And I looked up at him and I said, pretty good friends, I hope. And I think that's how it turned out. Well, I think one of the great lessons from Titanic is, yeah, the ship sank, but the story is about the people. And we go on a journey with these two characters, Caden and Leo, as they go through the movie. And... We have a different experience. We know the ship sinks, but we're not thinking about that. And one of the best news that we got when we previewed the movie for the first time for an audience to get their feedback, we knew the movie was, at that time, too long. And I always felt that the goal was to get rid of the TOO in front of long. And what audiences told us was where they wanted it to be shorter was during the sinking, which told us that the character story was working, the love story was working, and that's what separates the film from so many others. What Jim was like working on Titanic was what he needed to be. He needed to be a general running a big, complicated set. And he needed to 
uh, do it with, with, with a voice of, that was commanding, but also a voice of compassion uh, when, when he needed it. And the logistics of Titanic and the scale of that uh, required Jim to be on top of his game for every single shot that we were doing. But day in and day out, what I was always impressed by Jim, no matter how big the crane was that he was doing a camera shot from, no matter how many extras, he always focused on the performance, whether it be between Jack and Rose, whether it be between Rose and her mother, whether it be between you know Ismay and, and Thomas Andrews. It, it came down to him that the scale and the spectacle wasn't what was important. It was the drama and the performances he was able to get from all of the cast. Well, yeah, look, I, I don't think it's a question of re-experiencing the Titanic. I think anybody who's only watched it at home has never experienced Titanic. I think that uh, this is a movie that plays differently on the big screen. I think you are drawn into these characters. You are drawn into the jeopardy uh, of the sinking like you couldn't be at home. And I think people owe it to themselves to see it on the big screen. And she did come from a different class. I mean, she was the nouveau riche, and uh, she had made her money, her husband had made her money, uh, their money in a silver mine. And so she was really trying to claw her way up the social ladder, and she got a kick out of these, um, you know, uh, high-class people. But it didn't change who her personality, who she was as a woman. And after, after docking, after, after surviving, she went home to Denver, Colorado, and she was involved in a great many charities, I understand. And um, so, yeah, that informed a lot of, to me, Molly Brown was the American spirit, the American West, and uh, that the pioneer spirit um, that, that, that she, um, she didn't change who she was. You know, I mean, she, she, she wore fancy clothes and she had great luggage and all of that stuff that she could afford, but she didn't change who she was. The, the the artistry and the technique of, of doing all of that. I mean, he, you know, that amazing shot, shot when Kate's coming in to board the ship, you know, and you're on her hat and she looks up and the whole sky opens up with that ship and the car being loaded and the gulls flying. And I mean, it, he got such a sense of expanse. I mean, when you say David Lean, I mean, it, it, you know, they don't, we don't do that a lot. It's a lot about the tight shot and this and that, the expanse of, you know, that ocean and the, the ship itself, you know, he, he captured that so beautifully. Certainly at the moments where they're on the prow of the ship together and, and at the end, of course, it's very a very sweeping score that's very part of, very much part of the emotional build of those moments and stuff. And, and I thought it was a beautiful theme, beautiful theme. And, um, and Celine Dion did a fantastic job. I mean, I thought he was so smart in bringing all of those elements together. You know, he didn't leave a stone unturned, you know, in terms of, of uh, of, of how to make his penny shine. No, I mean, he brought together so many elements of his own life in order to be able to accomplish this. You know, as we said, you know, that he, he, you couldn't have made that film without having been able to physically go down and see the wreck yourself. He took that experience, his experience of going down there and then making it into a film. That's why Titanic is alive today. That's why the film is here. That was Jim's personal experience. So you can't take that away from him. Oh, I think people will always be fascinated about the Titanic. And this is just another way for them to tap into it. I think that's it, it it's a haunting, haunting experience. It made perfect sense to me. And I thought there's no one better to equip to, to, to tell this story than, than James. I mean, he just, uh, his, his obsession with the story is it was what made this movie so, I think, unique. For that movie to begin, uh, it was like, I, I just got so emotional seeing everybody and, 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 and I just could not believe how beautiful it was. I, I just, I, I was in awe. 
of, of James and, and, and the crew and everyone on it in the movie who had worked so hard. And there it was, Russell Carpenter, the, the, the DP, just, I mean, it was like, it was like watching, it was, it was as close to perfection as anything I could have imagined. You know, I wasn't aware of the shift um, because really once I saw it, uh, I just kn I knew that this was going to be a kind of a classic. I, I was involved, I very luckily hopped onto a train that, that went into the stratosphere, you know, and I, I um, was just lucky, really, uh, to, 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 to be a part of it. So I, I was never... You know, I'm still, I'm still kind of, it still surprises me at just how popular the movie is. I mean, I can't, I still, that's the word where people, what I get recognized most for in my life is Titanic. I mean, still, and, and that's from everyone from like, little girls from like 12 to, you know, the checkout lady at the, at the grocery store. It's like, oh, Titanic, you know. Well, it's just a, tra a human tragedy. It's just we're 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 all just intrigued by that, and um, and we relate to it on 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 different levels. You know. You know, it's also a, you know a classic love story. We always relate to those. I, I just think it has all the elements of real drama, and it's it's an amazing story. So that to me, that's well, that's why we go out. To the theater. That's that's. It has all the elements of everything we we want, uh, and so it's not surprising that people have had that response. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's one of his great gifts is that you know he does care about the story. I mean, he really does care about the characters, about and and the uh, the truth uh, in every moment of, the, of his movies and that's why I think they're as compelling as they are because you know I, I wouldn't be able to stay with it unless I was invested and, and he, he does that I think brilliantly.